we are again. Well, actually, here we are for the first time. Today, I'm going to make a piment, a mead, primarily out of the honey, yeast, and grape, or grape juice, as it is in this. I went to the store and I bought organic uh, grape juice, no preservatives, nothing, no additives, nothing. Uh, that should do very well. And I have locally sourced honey, national, that is. I'm not entirely sure if this one is imported or not, but it's pretty good. It's nicely dark, nice color, very nice smell, and um, it should do good. Um, I also have already put on a starter for the yeast. You can see there's a lot of, maybe you can see it, there's a lot of... Uh, uh, stuff going on here. I am using a uh, a VB21 uh, from Y yeast, I believe. And uh, this is a yeast that is much more uh, tilted towards fruity wines rather than mead. Um, so because of that, it will also presumably handle the lower pH that I have in the um, grape juice compared to what normal water and honey would give. So that's my choice of yeast for this particular. Otherwise I'm um, quite happy with the D47 which is a staple among many mead makers. So um, what I'll do here, I'll just put this one back on. There we go. And it can do some aeration already of the uh, of the yeast to make a nice and healthy starter. It has actually already been on for about an hour um, and since this video is going to take quite a few hours, what you see is, well, let's just say a summary of it all, um, it should be very nice by the time we actually pitch it. Um, I have here a 5 liter container of water. I actually am going to have just about uh, half a liter of water in this because um, the Grape juice that I have is extremely strong flavor. I think that will overpower quite a bit. So I have made the decision of just watering it out slightly. So uh, in order to make um, everything fit well, uh, I'm going to heat up just slightly the grape juice and the honey. The honey I'll just microwave and that'll, that'll work perfectly well. Uh, it's not going to be heated enough for um, the heat to start taking out any of the characteristics of the honey. I'm not going to bore you with, you know, half an hour of doing that. So I'm going to pause it here and come back as soon as everything's ready to be mixed. Let's see if I go this way. All right, so we're back. It's been a short while, I'd say. Uh, what I've done so far is that I have poured three liter of the uh, grape juice into a casserole pan, yeah, cooking pan, and uh, I heated it slightly up as well as um, and had the um, the uh, see here I had the honey into it and have mixed this together. That makes it easier for me to you know measure it afterwards. I have also measured it with the um, hydrometer. We are now at a healthy 1.120. Uh, along with the yeast and the starter there, that will bring you down to around 1.15. Uh, oh, yeah, about 1.15. And uh, that's pretty much what I'm looking for so far. Let me just put my camera back here so I can be nicely in the picture when I get back there. And um, like I said, I have also, this container here, there's a little bit of water in it because I want to get the pH levels up to a area where I know that the yeast will thrive. So literally what I'm going to do now, I am just going to um, pour the grape juice and honey into, <clears throat> into the um, fermenting vessel. And... Um, for as far as I can put it. Uh, I'm gonna fill it up just around the paper area here. Um, there will be some leftovers. 
uh, I will put the um, the yeast into it. There will be some leftovers, but trust me, there is a plan to it. Um, tomorrow I'm making another batch, which I'm unfortunately not filming because that's my signature batch. And as you understand, I cannot give away my uh, trade secret. Not that I'm actually getting paid for it, but well, you know, my friend like and really like the um, brutally blueberry, as I call it, but wildly wild berries, perhaps this one should be. Uh, so I'm not giving away the recipe for it. I'll just um, tease you about it instead. All right. This might be a little bit messy, I'll be honest with that. It's not every day I do this, so I have put it in the sink. And even though it might actually seem a little bit unsanitary to do so, um, it's clean in here and the bottle has been cleaned. As you see, I'm dousing it with start on just in case. And from there on, putting the mix into it all. Actually, that's what's... Not so much a mess, but that's why I have it in the sink. And that's pretty much where I want to be. Let's see here. Yeah. So now I have, uh, I don't know, half a liter left for the starter of tomorrow. That's pretty good stuff. So what I'll do now, I am going to take my aerator and prepare the must. I know not everybody does it this way. I do. And prepare the must, ex-oxygenate the must as much as I can before I put the starter in. Um, just a quick note on that. In the starter, I also have Fermade O, which I have here. And I have put in a little bit of yeast nutrient. And that is, of course, to make sure that the uh, yeast has the best possible uh, environment to grow in. Let's see if I can put this one back where it is. Honestly, this is the first time I make a video, so trust me, this is not Hollywood making this. So. I'm going to take a short break. Uh, the starter will have its fun. I'm going to put the aerator in here. I'm going to put that probably in my big black box here. It is indeed. This one has already been prepared, so it is much more sanitary than you would, than you would think. And as always, I literally douse everything in uh, in Star Sun because I rather make sure that every nasty is killed off than have a problem later on. So that's it, and it's working wonders. I will put a little bit of tinfoil over this, just in case. We, all, we have all had these accidents where we forget to put tinfoil or cover, and we come back and there's the freak fly that has found its way in. So, just to make sure that doesn't happen, I wrap it up in tinfoil. The air has all the opportunity to escape where it wants to. No problem. And uh, the yeast starter will stay, this whole thing will stay and have fun now for about an hour. Meanwhile, I will take the pan with the leftovers and stick it in the fridge, which is just here. And by tomorrow, it will be part of the wild green wild berries. And sometimes around summer 2018, I will have 
two or three friends of mine probably getting extremely happy for their birthday gift. All right, see you in a half an hour or hour. My friends, we are back and it's been a little bit longer time than original thought it would take us. Well, I went home and had dinner, fell asleep, so it's now about 8 o'clock in the evening. I left here around 5, so naturally the yeast has had a lot of good time to become an all-out fantastic starter. So what's left to do now is literally just to pour it into here and let the yeast do it. Magic. I'm just gonna take this one off and the stir stops. Let's put this here. And um, what I have done also with this one, uh, I mentioned initially that I wanted the pH to go up. So I have had, uh, well, I have treated it a little bit to get the pH uh, just over four. Uh, and this will now be a much more healthier environment for the yeast. This already smells of significant yeast activity. So I'm just going to pour it in here. And that's pretty much all we're going to do now. Over the weekend, I am going to aerate it again and I am going to make sure that yeah, I think that's about enough so you see there's a little bit left here I'm gonna leave that for my project tomorrow I am also putting in a little bit of bentonite uh, that is just to help clarify it later on and another good benefit of using ben bentonite is that it helps against overly foaming in the brew. Uh, after all, this is small particles that will rise up along with the yeast and as it breaks the surface and tries to, to form uh, bubbles, the uh, ash or whatever you want to call it, the bentonite cells, small particles, they will actually help burst the bubbles. So I'm just going to pour that in here and leave it to work. So I'm not going to, I'm just going to put the cork on like this. It can do its own little thing. And like I did with this little thing, I actually put this one on for yesterday or so. And it's still bubbling nicely. You can see here. And uh, this one is um, about a day old. So it still has well, a little bit of, um, how to say, it still works like a charm. I can see the bubbles come up here. This is a chai tea um, mead, methagaline, I think it's called. And it is super happy right now. It's about time I give this one the uh, second, what's it called? The second. Um, uh, portion of its uh, fermaid oh it's gonna go in another two gram or so in this one this one has already had its first two grams and it will have another round tomorrow and another round after that again and so this one will also have its second round today and its third round of fermaid tomorrow and after that I will just leave it be uh, this will probably ferment for about two weeks and this will probably ferment for two, two and a half weeks, depending on how much the yeast work its magic. So that's all. Um, if I have forgotten anything, feel free to uh, put any questions in the comment section. Uh, do visit us at uh, viking-mjod.no. You will probably find the link somewhere down in the corner of this YouTube video. I will try to fix it. And um, there will be more videos coming along. I will try to make one or two videos per month, uh, making a new type of mead or explaining a particular part of mead making.
So that's all for today. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. Please follow me. Thank you.